I mean, Pinot Noir guys, 96% reduction in aromatized enzyme activity. I know what my favorite is going to be. Actually, I prefer Cabernet Sauvignon, but you know, the scientific evidence shows that Pinot Noir is superior. Vigorous leaf here. You know what also increases testosterone levels? Red wine, apparently. Red wine contains phenolic compounds which can inhibit glucuronidation, which is one of the pathways at which testosterone or other sex hormones are excreted from the body. And these phenolic compounds can also inhibit aromatase enzyme activity and thus prevent the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. So by preventing the metabolism of testosterone outside of the body or the metabolism of uh, testosterone into estradiol, testosterone levels go up, at least in vitro. There's two studies that I want to highlight in this video. Both are in vitro studies, so it's a little bit of a stretch, but bear with me since we're on such a good roll of figuring out which consumables can actually increase testosterone levels. We had the Coca-Cola, we had the Pepsi-Cola, we had smoking, nicotine, so why not cover red wine? And if you guys know of any other compounds that fall under this wide umbrella of consumables, let me know down below in the comment section. I would love to make a video about it if, and only if, there's some scientific evidence to back it up. Before we get into this video, please like it, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. If you want to support the channel for my upcoming um, wine habit to increase my total testosterone levels, because again, HCG monotherapy and clomiphene monotherapy and even testosterone replacement therapy isn't even required. If you stick with cola, cigarette smoking, or red wine, right? If you want to fund my red wine habits, you can do so by joining either the YouTube or Patreon memberships, or you can vote for upcoming deep dives and join the weekly Vickers Q&A, which is always on Saturday, right? Besides my Increlex habits, I'm going to have a red wine habit as well, because exogenous testosterone is still off the menu. The first study I want to highlight is from Jenkinson et al. published on September 7, 2012, titled Red Wine and Component Flavonoids Inhibit UGT2B17 in vitro. UGT2B17 is the enzyme responsible for glucuronidation, not to be mistaken with LGBTQIA2S+. That's something entirely different, but also a very long abbreviation. So we're going to talk about glucuronidation in this video, not entirely something different. Basically, long story short, the metabolism and excretion of anabolic steroid testosterone occurs by glucuronidation to the conjugate testosterone glucuronidite, which is then excreted in urine. Alterations in UGT2B17 glucuronidation enzyme activity could alter the rate of testosterone excretion and thus its bioavailability. The aim of this study is to investigate if red wine, a common dietary substance, has the inhibitory effect on glucuronidation. And the results of this study show that increasing the concentration of red wine resulted in a lower conversion of testosterone to its glucuronidite conjugate. So that means the higher concentration of red wine, again, in an in vitro study, between 2 to 8%, reduces the amount of testosterone that's converted into testosterone glucuronidite, which would then otherwise be excreted through the kidneys in the form of urine. So the more inhibition of this enzyme that is taking place at higher red wine concentration, so this is your excuse to start drinking more and more and more, right? so you can bring the total concentration of your body, uh, which is uh, percentage-wise red wine as high as possible, the more red wine is present, the less testosterone converts into its conjugated version, um, which is then otherwise excreted. So as you can see here in the bar chart, at a 2% red wine concentration after one hour, there's still, give or take, 80% glucuronidation activity present. So that's a reduction of 20%. But after two hours, it's only a reduction of 10%. But when you go to the 8% red wine concentration, after one hour, there's, let's see, um, give or take 60% glucuronidation activity present. So that's a reduction of over 40%. But after two hours, it's a reduction of over 70%, 72% to be exact. So again, a higher concentration of red wine, within one to two hours, you get over 72% glucuronidation activity reduction, resulting in more actual testosterone, less testosterone being marked for excretion through the kidneys. Now, what I really like about the study is that they also investigated if ethanol, alcohol, had a positive or negative effect on the rate of reduction of glucuronidation that the phenolic compounds of red wine 
half. The results indicated that testosterone glucuronidation was only slightly altered by ethanol at a 1% concentration. However, as the concentration of ethanol was increased to above 2% of the reaction volume, testosterone glucuronidation was affected as shown, but not reaching a statistically significant level. If you look at the bar chart here, you see that 1% to 2% to 3% ethanol concentration does have a more pronounced effect on glucuronidation activity inhibition, but I would say that there's a huge overlap between the 2, 4, 6, and 8% red wine concentration. Again, they made extracts of the actual red wine and then started adding in the ethanol. But as the researchers said, the inclusion of ethanol at various concentrations is of no statistical significance. The analysis of the red wine confirmed the presence of gallic acid, chlorogenic acid, caffeic acid, p-cumeric acid, and quercetin, which informed subsequent experiments. The three red wine phenolics inhibited the UGT2B17 glucuronidation enzymes by a varying amount in the order of quercetin, a maximum of 72% inhibition, caffeic acid, 22% inhibition, and gallic acid, 9% inhibition. Quercetin was selected from the initial high concentration screening assay for further study as it exhibited the highest level of inhibition at 72%. Reducing the testosterone levels to 20 micromoles resulted in an inhibition of 34 to 18% by a low concentration of quercetin in a concentration dependent manner, despite the tenfold excess in testosterone levels. So, what they notice here in the discussion is that it has yet to be determined if any direct inhibition of steroid glucuronidation enzymes could alter the levels of circulating serum testosterone in addition to altering the level of testosterone excreted in serum. Why do they determine this? Because it's an in vitro study. It's still very interesting. Now we have three compounds which inhibit glucuronidation in various extents. Again, uh, quercetin up to 72%, caffeic acid up to 22%, and gallic acid up to 9%. But wait, that's not all. There's another study I want to highlight, performed by Eng et al., published in May 2001, so it's a little bit old, titled Suppression of Aromatase Estrogen Synthase by Red Wine Phytochemicals, or Phenolic Compounds. In this study, the researchers found that wine contains phytochemicals that are capable of suppressing aromatase. Red wine is shown to be much more effective than white wine in suppression of aromatized activity. Here they highlight in the introduction, flavonoids have been found as phytoestrogens in which these compounds have structures that are recognized as estrogen mimetics for the estrogen receptor. Right? This is why we avoid soy or beer, because it contains compounds that might actually activate estrogen receptors. They can compete with endogenous estrogen for binding to the estrogen receptor. Therefore, they can act as anti-estrogens or weak estrogens and thus can interfere with the onset of tumor genesis of the breast. This is a breast cancer study after all. Since estrogen is a product of aromatase, it is not unexpected that some of these compounds can behave as inhibitors of aromatase. Like I mentioned in the steroidogenesis inhibitors video, there's actually a larger list of compounds which can inhibit aromatized enzyme activity. Suppressing estrogen biosynthesis in cells, flavonoids and other phytochemicals have been shown to be effective aromatized inhibitors. Again, watch that video if you haven't watched it. I'll link it at the end of this one. Now, if you have a look at table one, we see a very nice selections of red wines and white wines. They have Cabernet Sauvignon from California, France, and Chile. They have Merlot from California, Pinot Noir, California. Sinfandel, California, Chardonnay, California, Fumé Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc, also from California, ranging with an alcohol percentage of, let's say, 12 up to 14 percent, years between 1996 up to 1998. At the time that this study was performed in 2001, uh, a couple years of, um, you know, quality assurance. So not a worse selection of um, Cabernets, I would say. I would prefer the one from France or Chile, but again, you know, if you drink red wine or white wine coming from California, very good selection of red wines and white wines. I will say that I have um, experimented with many a Californian wine back in the day. So it's very interesting that they took so many high quality wines to investigate for the study. Here they highlight in the results, the Chardonnay, Fumé Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc white wines did not have any significant inhibitory effects 
on aromatase. So luckily, all the women that drink white wine, I'm just generalizing here, they don't have to worry that their serum estradiol levels are suddenly going to go lower. Conversely, the red wines, Pinot Noir, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon were clearly able to inhibit aromatase at all dosages, all concentrations, and in a dose-dependent manner. So the more red wine you drink, the more aromatase enzyme activity is reduced, and thus your testosterone levels are going to go up. The greatest inhibition was seen with 50 microliters of the original Pinot Noir, with only 4% of aromatase activity remaining. So that's a reduction of what, 96%? Merlot, 7.9% aromatase activity remaining. So that's uh, off the top of my head, 92.1% reduction. And Cabernet Sauvignon had a remaining aromatase activity of 7.7%. So that's what, 92.3% reduction? I mean, Pinot Noir, guys, 96% reduction in aromatized enzyme activity. I know what my favorite is going to be. Actually, I prefer Cabernet Sauvignon, but you know, the scientific evidence shows that Pinot Noir is superior. These results suggest that red wine contains active components that can suppress aromatase. Yes, that's what we're here to investigate. Furthermore, the results indicate that the active components are not present in white wine. So now, you know, going through the study a little bit more, they try to investigate which of these uh, phytochemicals, these phenolic compounds, are actually responsible for this severe reduction in aromatized enzyme activity, uh, but they couldn't figure it out. And in this study, just like the previous study, they also investigated if ethanol, alcohol, had a contributing effect on this severe reduction of aromatized enzyme activity. Here they mentioned in the results, for all dosages, <laughs> For all dosages of red wine studied, I like how to say dosages and not servings or glasses of red wine. For all dosages of red wine studied, no differences were apparent in the complete wine versus the lyophilized wine reconstituted in equal volume of water. Uh, so apparently there's um, vials of wine available. All you have to do is add a little bit of sterile water and now you have a little ampule, one milliliter reconstituted wine for your wine replacement therapy. So here, basically, long story short, they're comparing regular wine versus wine where the alcohol has been removed. Therefore, the inhibition of aromatase by red wine does not seem to be a phenomenon of alcohol. So just like the previous study where it showed that alcohol had a negligible effect on the inhibition of glucuronidation, this study also confirms that alcohol has a negligible effect on the inhibition of aromatase enzyme activity. Moving over to the discussion, the apparent differences in aromatized activity between red versus white wines lie between the grapes and the wine processing. Our previous work revealed that both green and red seedless grape juices suppressed aromatized activity with similar potency. Subject for another video, maybe we don't even need to go with red wine, maybe we just go with um, a green or red seedless grape juice. Right? We don't have to subject ourselves to alcohol, even though there's uh, alcohol-free red wines available, maybe you can just go with grape juice. Some nice, good old grape juice to boost your testosterone levels. Stay tuned. These results indicate that the active components are present in both green and red grapes. Red wine is a rich source of polyphenolic compounds compared to white wines because skins and seeds are not removed during the grape crushing process of red wine. And keep in mind that in France, back in the day, they would not use the machine press, but you would get French feet in your wine, compressing <laughs> all the grapes to the point you get a grape juice. And of course, a little bit of the aroma from the French feet is included in the final product, right? I don't think they do this nowadays, but you never know, right? Our results indicate that both grape and red wine contain potent components that can suppress aromatized cytochrome P450. Yes, aromatized enzymes are cytochrome P450 enzymes. The fact that suppression of aromatized activity was seen with both uh, grape and red wine does not necessarily indicate that identical compounds are responsible for this action. So further investigation needs to take place. And again, in this study, they couldn't uh, really determine which of the phytochemicals, the polyphenols, were responsible for the inhibition of aromatized enzymes. Now, after reading both of these studies, I did a little bit more research and I was reminded after the sterogenesis inhibitor video that quercetin, besides inhibiting glucuronidation, can also inhibit aromatized enzyme activity again 
in in vitro studies. So keep that in mind. I also found that green and white teas can actually suppress glucuronidation. So maybe that's another valid method to increase testosterone levels. Uh, but let's save that for another video. Now, I'm well aware that this scientific data is far from conclusive. We're using dubious extrapolation as an excuse for wine replacement therapy. So let's put it to the test. I found out which countries have the highest wine consumption. You can find that data down below. I linked all my sources down below. We're using the International Organization of Vine and Wine matched with the testosterone decline is a website which tracks the average testosterone levels of a multitude of countries. So here you see in the uh, total picture that Portugal has the highest wine consumption. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to determine with my sources how much of that is red wine versus white wine. So we're going to have to go with the average of all wines consumed. Portugal is at the top of the list with 67.5 liters per year. Good job. And China is at the bottom of the list with less than a liter per year, right? Now, when we look at the testosterone levels, Portugal, an average testosterone level of 537 nanograms per deciliter, or let's say 18.5 nanomoles per liter. Yes, I did the conversion because I do understand that there's some nanomoles per liter guys out there. Second on the list is France. Surprising to see, even though France was the originator of wine products, 47.5 liters consumed per year with a total testosterone level of 420. What's going on over there? 420 nanograms per deciliter. Italy, 44.4 liters per year, a total testosterone of 556 nanograms per deciliter. Now we can keep going and keep going, but I highlighted all of the outliers with a 10% deviation from the average. So if you go down to the bottom, you see the world average of uh, wine consumption is 23.6 liters per year. The world average of total testosterone is 466 nanograms per deciliter or 16.17 nanomoles per liter. So anything that had a 10% higher or 10% lower than the mean average, I bold it or um, highlight it in either green or red. So 10% deviation from the average in red is below 21.24 liters consumed per year. That's wine. And green, green is above 25.96 liter of wine consumed per year. And the bolded ones are the lowest in the highest value. And I did the same thing for the testosterone level. A 10% deviation of the average in, in red is below 419 nanograms per deciliter. And in green is above 513 nanograms per deciliter. And again, bolded are the lowest and the highest levels. So you see here, based on the data that I was able to piece together, apparently Netherlands has a high average testosterone level of 600 nanograms per deciliter and Russia, 619 nanograms per deciliter. If you go to any of these websites, you see that Mongolia has the highest testosterone level on the planet on average, probably because the Mongolians are a little bit closer to nature. They're um, alpha as I've been there twice, and those guys are mean and lean and strong. They love to wrestle. They love to play archery, all this masculine stuff. And a lot of the women in Mongolia, or at least in Ulaanbaatar, beautiful, right? So this increases your testosterone level. Um, I will say that Russia and Mongolia also has a very high instance of alcoholism, and I wasn't able to find scientific evidence that alcoholism can actually increase total testosterone level. So... Again, this website, this testosteronedecline.com, is piecing all of it together from the limited scientific evidence that's available. Um, so there might be a little bit of discrepancy in the measuring parameters and the overall sample groups, right, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to work with the information that we have. Still, when you look at this data, I would say that there's absolutely no correlation between wine consumption and testosterone levels. Again, because we don't really know how much of the wine consumption is actually red wine or white wine, or maybe they mix in a little bit of port here and there, and it's also a wine product. Because when you look at the low wine consuming countries, they have four high testosterone levels and three low testosterone levels. And the countries with a lot of wine consumption also have four high testosterone levels, again, on average, and one low testosterone level on average. So that's four high versus four high, either low wine consumption or high wine consumption. I would say that there's no correlation here. Still, it was very interesting to piece this data together. Uh, maybe there's some overlapping effects. Again, this is uh, data from, coming from all over the world. 
using various testing parameters and uh, data collection points, or better yet, inaccuracy is to be expected. But this is what we can work with. So, can you use red wine to boost your testosterone levels? Let me know down below. What do you think? Do you think red wine is warranted? Besides the Coca-Cola or the Pepsi-Cola or the cigar smoking or the cigarette smoking, maybe to boost your testosterone levels? Let's see. If you're a chronic wine drinker, let us know down below what your total testosterone levels currently are. I don't drink red wine frequently, maybe once every two months, three months. I still prefer whiskey with my cigar, and hopefully the cigar can also increase my testosterone levels. But if I find some conclusive evidence from anecdotal blood work, I'm going to make the switch and stick with cigars and red wine going forward. Um, maybe quercetin is the actual root cause of this boost in testosterone in the in vitro studies, and thus quercetin should have a boatload of scientific evidence that it can boost testosterone levels and should be included in all of the over-the-counter testosterone boosters, which in many cases it is not. Maybe there's an open market here, uh, or maybe it simply doesn't work. Food for thought. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigor's crew, you guys know what to do. Soon to be a red wine replacement therapy cannons right in your face. Um, but it might be intermittent here and there. So I might have a little bit of a boost of testosterone the next day, but certainly not every day because I like my cognition the way it is. And well, let's be honest, alcohol-free red wine tastes like... Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.